Hi everyone and welcome to Alliance Live, the online information and learning portal showcasing examples of innovation and integrated working taking place across Scotland within health and social care. We continue the series of these 30 minute webinars focusing on the development of the My Support My Choice research project and next steps. My Support My Choice is a joint research project between the Health and Social Care Alliance Scotland and Self-Directed Support Scotland funded by the Scottish Government. It aims to establish how self-directed support, or SDS, is working in practice for supporting for people accessing social care across Scotland so that we can promote good practice and future change. This Alliance Live webinar is presented by Dr Hannah Tweed, a Senior Policy Officer at the Alliance. Finally, as panellists deliver their presentations, we invite the audience to pose questions using the chat box which is found within the toolbar at the bottom of your screen. These will make up the questions for the Q&A session, which will follow on from the presentations and bring our webinar to a close. So now without further delay, uh, over to Hannah. Okay. I was gonna say nice, nice to meet you, but that's not something that happens with a digital screen. Um, I also have to offer apologies from my uh, colleague across at SDS Scotland, Diane Feakston. Um, she's unfortunately unable to join us, so apologies for the false advertising on that front. It was unintentional. Um, and uh, if you have any queries, both of us would be very happy to answer them at a later date. Um, okay, so Nick's given us a bit of a brief introduction to the My Support, My Choice project. Um, but I'm gonna give you a bit more detail to kick off with. Um, so this is a project running across Scotland, funded by the Scottish Government and split between um, the Alliance and SDS Scotland. We're running it in a variety of formats. So we have a survey which is available in print and online formats, um, online via the SDS Scotland website and in print with distribution across a number of local authorities. So the online version is available across Scotland. Um, anyone anywhere in Scotland is welcome to fill it out. We would appreciate that. Um, and the print version is through the assistance of participating local authorities. That's eight in the first instance, with further to follow in wave two. Also accompanying that with a range of semi-structured interviews. So we've done over 80 at this point. I've genuinely lost count, but it's approximately a lot. Um, and that's really to drill down and get just a bit more sense and, and detail into people's experiences of self-directed support in ways that you get from a survey, but I think you just get a bit more nuance and, and, and can build in the sort of wider structures and, and pictures of what's going on um, to combine that in mixed methods work. We're also running a range of focus groups. They're primarily centered around uh, particular demographics and uh, protected characteristics. But again, trying to do that across a, fair, a broad range of different geographical locations in Scotland and drawing together people from a bunch of different locations. Um, okay, so that's the sort of whistle stop tour. More details available in the Q&A, should you wish them. Um, local authority areas we're working in, um, in the first instance, include Dumfries and Galloway, Scottish Borders, South and North Lanarkshire, Highland, Stirling, Glasgow and Fife. And we've got just beginning to start wave two, simultaneously to doing the write up for wave one, because there's nothing like multitasking coming into Christmas. Um, and we're beginning work in Moray this week. In fact, I'm about to hit the road after this podcast and drive up to Moray to do interviews with a lot of, a lot of people, um, up to 10 in each local authority area, I should have said, as part of this context, um, with a number of other possible um, local authorities who are in discussion with us about engagement. So, Edinburgh, Dundee, Aberdeenshire, um, various other locations. Um, those are to be confirmed on the slide for obvious reasons, um, but we're still in that um, section. In terms of the ethos of the research, um, one of the things that's really important and has been since the outset is the idea of co-production. So as part of that, we've got two elements that we've really uh, prioritized throughout this. Um, first of those is peer researchers. So in addition to the prime research, um, research team of Diane and myself, um, we also have a team of peer researchers who are self people who self-identify um, as being disabled or having a living with long-term conditions um, and who want to be involved in the research. So we then work with them to train them up in mixed methods research 
and they carry out some of the interviews for us and have been involved in focus groups in uh, presenting some of our research findings um, and in feeding into the development of the research questions and sort of how we're approaching this. Um, so it's been really useful, um, I think, for us and the feedback from our peer research team has been that they have also found that this to be a, a useful experience, but it's sort of trying to, trying to keep that pointing in both directions. We've also got a project advisory group, which comes with the really, really appealing acronym PAG, um, who are a range, who's comprised of a range of national and local organizations who are involved with social, self-directed support or social care in one way or another. Their role is to advise the research team, primarily through an online portal, um, but also in face-to-face -face meetings um, on occasion. And again, that's something that we're keep really keen to see geographical breadth and a sort of range of different perspectives on SDS so that we can draw from their expertise and any concerns they might have about the research and really use that to build and refine it as we've been going through both the development of the research project and now as we're moving into the findings and analysis stage um, as we're then working out the dissemination practices. Um, I mentioned the focus groups earlier. So these are some of the ones that we have primarily worked along aside, uh, uh, been working on. Um, so we've had focus groups with people with learning disabilities, um, centered around women as users of SDS, uh, older people, um, BME people, LGBT community, um, focus groups centered on mental health. That one is still pending, but we're, we're moving forward with it. Um, rural communities, visual impairments, and parent guardian carriers, just to sort of really get as broad a range of um, input as we possibly can on the project. And particularly in some of these instances, trying to make sure that voices that are perhaps less commonly heard within um, policymaking are really brought to the fore and we, we have sort of dedicated work on that. I should have said in terms of the reportage from this project, we're doing a range of different formats. So we've got local authority specific reports, so things like Dumfries and Galloway is the first one we're working on. Um, and we tailor our findings to that particular uh, area of Scotland. We're also doing um, a Scotland-wide report, sort of that'll be the end uh, of June 2020, putting everything together into a, into a beast of a document, um, and also uh, thematic ones. And the thematic reports will be centered mostly around the themes of the, around the specific focus groups. Um, so particular uh, focus on people with learning disabilities or mental health, or these, these, these um, sections. So yeah, lots of, lots of writing in the, in the current stage of the work. Um, and we're also then feeding those back, not only in report format, but also in things like local authority feedback sessions, which are I think, um, events that we're hoping will be really quite broad in nature, quite participatory, and can really prompt discussion from local authority staff, from um, representations from across the community, from people in the third sector organizations, and from people who use and engage with social care, um, to really get sort of, again, that breadth of voice engaging with not only what we've heard and what we're reporting back from people, but where next? What are the next steps? How do you build on these recommendations and these, take, these, these potential actions? Um, okay, so um, we've got a f um, initial report writing is taking place at the moment. Um, I'm not going to uh, pre, pre preempt some of the findings around um, specific local authorities at the moment because we're at the point of just sharing them with local authorities, and it seems a little a little unfair to do that uh, via via a di uh, an online format before we actually meet with people. Um, but we do have some sort of early high level findings that we're beginning to work with as we're getting a decent bulk of data coming in at this stage although i will say these are not complete because we're still getting survey responses they could shift so if there's difference between what i'm about to talk about and some of the uh, final reports that's why it's based in my preamble um, but what we are finding is on the positive we're saying that we're finding that most people around 70 to 80 percent um, varying depending on survey input feel that overall SDS has improved their social care experience. I think that's something that the team have found really important to put first and foremost, because there's quite a lot of areas where there are problems coming up. This will not surprise anybody that there are areas where there's room for improvement, but that it is important to hold that alongside this overall res uh, response that actually people are saying, this is improving my overall care experience. Um, we're finding things like most people are hearing about SDS via social work, followed by friends and family, um, broadly expected, but quite surprised by how, just how few people are hearing about it from, say, health professionals or other um, in, 
individuals who might be in a position to recommend that. And that's one of those areas where we're beginning to write up findings around scope for just making it easier for people to access information. And if that is coming through alternative um, routes, that that could be really potentially quite useful, particularly within the um, integration environment. Um, principles of SDS, prioritizing health of choice and control. Um, and I'd say while about approximately a third of our respondents um, are saying that they chose how their support is arranged, we're finding a very similar proportion, slightly less, around the 30% of respondents who are indicating that um, their social workers, care managers, or medical professionals chose how their support is arranged, not the respondents or their friends and family. And that's an interesting finding, both in terms of people's um, attitudes and expectations around who makes choice, but also, I think, a prompt for how those individuals in, the, in those professions can respond and reframe what their practice is to really prioritize people's independent engagement and choice. Um, so there's some challenges in there that I think we're really drilling down to in some of the specifics, particularly around cross-referencing, whether those respondents are on option one or option three, predominantly the latter, um, and trying to, trying to tease out that detail about, about different population groups um, and whether there are higher rates of that response and that um, perhaps less than ideal uh, material there. Um, also widespread discussions around the need for greater transparency and consistency. Um, highlighting respondents really highlighting that when there is transparency of process and consistency, um, particularly of consistency of social workers or consistency of practice across, say, a transition period from young adult to adult care, um, that that's really held up as a positive and really something that's that's made their life e significantly easier and of higher quality. Um, so some really striking uh, case studies around when things work, they work really well. And the flip side, that when it doesn't, this is something that people are really highlighting as having a really significant effect and impact on their day-to-day -day life and their access to independent living. Um, so we've got a lot of material around that that we're trying to tease out the sort of nuance of where can you take the areas for improvement and the areas of good practice and tease out patterns and actions that you can then work on and build on? Or equally, things that say if they're working in one area that is predominantly rural, um, that is not happening in another area of similar demographic and geography, are there points of comparison where you can go, well, actually, X area has really found that this is a helpful model. Can we switch? Can, can, we, can we share this more broadly so that it can be... Um, worked upon and attempted elsewhere. Um, okay, that's a sort of whistle-stop tour of some of the early findings. Again, um, I don't want to chat for too long about that, given that I'm aware I'm on, on the clock with Nick looking at his phone at me on, on up to my right. You need the stage right uh, images as I'm talking through this. Um, but in terms of our next steps, what we've got are the completion of the analysis, no, no, no pressure, um, and writing that up into local authority and thematic reports and beginning those discussions around the feedback sessions and, and, and where we go next with this. Um, also carrying out the wave to interviews and distribution. Um, if you are, we're still accepting all comers for people who wish to help us with distribution or who are interested um, in being engaged with interviews and um, facilitation in the project. So we'd really welcome hearing from anybody in that side of things. Um, contact details at the end of the slides. Um, and that's just the link to the online survey here. So verbally, that's um, www.sdsscotland.formtitan.com forward slash MSMC underscore survey. Um, also found by Googling My Support My Choice. Um, and also, we're really keen to get people letting us know if they're interested in being part of the feedback sessions. Um, again, as part of that drive to get as broad a range of people as possible involved. Uh, drop me a line, drop me an email, any variation thereof. We'll also be advertising um, both the continuation of the research and the findings as they come out um, via our Twitter and Project pa Partners websites. So that's SDS Scott for SDS Scotland and at Alliance Scott for us. Um, and uh, both Diane and I would be delighted to hear from people. Our email addresses and phone numbers are on the penultimate slide. Um, okay, so... Thank you very much for listening to that whistle stop tour and yeah, happy to field any questions that Nick might have received in the intervening time.
Um, we've not got we've not got anything coming through at the moment. Um, I'm just going to list off uh, the the contact details here. So we've still got some time if anyone wants to post in um, in the next couple of seconds or so. Um, but firstly, a, a thanks to Hannah for delivering the fantastic presentation, and um, we hope it's provided some insight and takeaways to bring to your own organizations. Um, so yeah, just before we go, uh, draw, draw your attention to some of the contact details we have on your screen here. If uh, anyone is interested in holding your own Alliance Live webinar or through the other activities that we have via podcast or video, um, you can get us via the Alliance Twitter, Alliance Scott, or using the hashtag Alliance Live, or you can email us live at alliance-scotland.org.uk. So as I'm reading that, I've got one question that has come in here um, in the chat box from Helen. She says, thank you very much, Hannah. Um, were you able to get any feedback from people with palliative care needs who were using SDS and how was it working for them? Okay, that's not been one of our explicit focus groups, but we have spoken to some people in interviews who are um, in receiving palliative care. I think that... I'm just trying to think about how to frame this with, a, with appropriate anonymization um, so that I don't reveal a, a information that's not appropriate. Um, in some areas, where, particularly when that's coming through cancer pathways, I think that um, there's some fairly good structures in place, people speaking very well in that instance of, uh, the, in the, of the connections between primary care and then social care. That's not been so much the case with some other interviewees who are end of life but not via that particular not with that particular um integrate in integrated system in place so there's been some quite broad variants um at the moment it's something that because our numbers of responses within that grouping are relatively low that i'm hesitant to draw significant broader themes around but we would be really keen to see and hear from more people um about their experiences there just so that we can have more data to work with and more more ability to reflect and and have constructive suggestions around it so um i know there's a number of third sector organizations who are on my list to email in the next week or two so you may expect something in your inbox shortly um but yeah we we we, we have early findings a little bit but nothing more substantial than that i'm afraid sorry if that's not a proper answer that's great. So that, that does uh, bring us to the end of the webinar. That was the, the, the last question that we had there. Um, finally, a big thank you to everyone that did register and had watched the webinar. Um, we hope to have you join for our next one on the 10th of December, which is uh, a week from today, titled What, Why and How of Human Rights Budget Work with Alison Hoysey, from a research officer from Scottish Human Rights Commission, uh, more information will be available on our website in the coming days. Thank you very much and thank you to Hannah.